impromptu, because Michelle, I had to piggyback off what you said. I just couldn't sit there and let it go to waste or let something come and take away from the moment. So I really want to press into this. Air hugs, we're not going to be friends in the moment. Let me just let you know now. About a month ago, I was lying down on the sofa with Rona, probably about 11 p.m. We were watching a sermon and the man said, women's conference 2004 makes some noise. I grabbed the remote. I pressed pause. I looked at Rona. I said, no way. She went, what? I said, 2004. She went, yeah. I said, that was 20 years ago. She said, yeah. I said, I was in secondary school in 2004. She started to laugh at me. I had a midlife crisis on the sofa in that moment. 20 years ago, I was in secondary school. I remember secondary school so vividly. I remember 20 years ago. 20 years ago is when I experienced my first heartbreak. I was in year seven. I was 11 years old. It was 2004. And to give you some context, my mum is an R&B fanatic. She had, she had the decks. She'd have Mary J. Blige. She'd be running Joe, Jagged Edge. So when I was in year six, I was a little R&B head. I, 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 I came into year seven with this context. And I used to listen to B2K. I, I thought I was Omari on that point. And I used to listen to these songs. You guys know. Oh, baby, you should let me love you. Let me be the one. Oh, hold on. I need a girl to. All right. And you know what's mad? I'm just checking to see who's got the Holy Spirit in it. The point I'm making, the point I'm making is MTV Bass will be on all the time. So I was introduced to this R&B type of love. I'd have a magnetic ear in my, I know you guys don't know about the magnetic ear in. I'd have the magnetic ear in my ear. I came into secondary school like this. So everyone's, they're going sweet boy, everyone's calling me a sweet boy and I'm feeling cute, you know what I'm saying? Then within a month of being in year seven, a girl two years older than me, approaches me and I find myself in a relationship with a girl who's older and I feel like the man I literally feel like I'm in a music video like and I had my first kiss with her she's the first girl I held hands with I remember these butterflies in my stomach and I'm not even joking here this year I'm not even joking I remember you see back then we used to use the house phone I didn't have a, I didn't have a phone mobile phone I didn't have a phone so we used to use the house phone. You lot don't know about the house phone being connected to the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we upgraded to the cordless phone. I am not lying to you. I remember hiding underneath my bunk bed on the phone with her. Cute. Bro, remember our bunk bed? I remember hiding underneath the bunk bed talking to you. You lot know about AOL dial-up? When you couldn't use the house phone. So, some, some of you lot don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway. <laughs> a week after being in the relationship, just someone say a week. <sighs> I felt butterflies for a week. Love has been awoken for a week. I'm doing the most for a week. And then a week later, I'm in the science block. I remember I'm in the science room. I'm in year seven. Me and my friends are sat down in the science room. There's a door and it has a circle window in it so you can see into the corridor. And I remember she peeked her head through quickly. And my friends are going, hey, bro, your girl's there. Your... And I'm, you know what I'm saying? I'm just, <laughs> you know, hold it down. <laughs> yeah, just chill, bro. Come on. So she's outside there waiting with me with her friend. I'm in year seven. And then I've come out and she's gone, we need to talk. I said to my friends, I'll, I'll, meet, I'll meet them in the class. So I said to them, you know, I'll meet you in the class. So I've gone around the corner with her and the friend. The friend's staying like a couple, couple meters away. And she's gone to me. Yeah, we can't be in a relationship no more. And have you ever felt that, that pain in your throat when... I can even feel it now. She's, she's, like, she's like, we can't be in a relationship no more. And I've gone, okay, okay. And then she said, yeah, you're just too immature for me. So she turns away. She's walking, she was coolie, yeah? 
She turns away her hair sway and left to right. She was in color. Everything around her was black and white. And then it's like a glass shattered in my vision. My heart broke. Just And then I felt like I was going to cry. So a friend came up to me, hugged me. I put my head on, on her friend's shoulder and I started sobbing. And then her friend goes, oh, you're emotional and pats my back. Emotional. Me. <laughs> Emo From that day onwards, it was a dog eat dog world. Yeah? That, that was the beginning of my villain story. Bow Wow lied to me. Chris Brown, all these guys, I started listening to grime, I started spitting bars, my life changed. <laughs> that was my villain story. And it's funny because. <laughs> I was thinking into today's sermon, and do you know what crossed my mind? We weren't created for heartbreak. <laughs> Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 4, please. We weren't created for heartbreak. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. <laughs> Do not stir up, or that means love is sleeping. Don't wake that thing up until it's necessary. Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all vigilance. Guard your heart, for from it flows the springs of life. Did I awaken love too quickly? Did I awaken something that should have been sleeping? Did I open up my heart too quickly that I experienced heartbreak at a young age? And then I started to think into how many of us in this room have awakened love too early. How many of us have felt the scars of heartbreak? How many of us have baggage that we're carrying from relationship to relationship? How many of us have lost, have, have lost trust with the opposite sex? That can't be how God intended relationships to be. But you see the way the culture's going. Culture's producing some heartbreak kids. We think it's cool to lock each other off. We think it's cool for cancel culture. We think it's cool to just practice divorce because that's what dating is. You're practicing divorce. You want an example? Let me give you an example. She's my girl. We're together, but I'm not sure about proposing with her. So she's my girl. We're together, but I'm not sure about proposal. So, so the relationship literally is just fun. There's no final destination. We're just exploring each other. So we're going to invest so much time in each other that we either just settle or we're going to split and I've stolen three years of your life. That can't be how God intended relationships to be. So, 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 so here's what it sounds like. This is what dating literally is. I go to a car lot. I pick up a car. I take that car home. I'm driving it now to see if it's the right car for me. Now, if it's not the right car for me, I'm going to drive it back to the lot. It doesn't matter that I run up the mileage a little bit. It doesn't matter that I put petrol in it a little bit. I'm going to use it, then I'm going to take it back so someone else can enjoy that car. Then I'm going to do the same thing with another car until I find the car I want. So we're just test driving each other. Demonic. Because our idea of a relationship is having sex with it. When the Bible says flee sexual immorality, but we're proud of our body count. The Bible tells you to flee the very thing that you glorify. I've got mad experience, my boy. I've got mad experience. My body count's mad. Yeah? And I just need to get it out of my system before I get married. Get what out of your system? Why is it in your system in the first place? You see, here's the issue. The more relationships we have, the more comparison we have, the more baggage we have, the more callous we are, the more jaded we are, the more all men are the same we are, the more all women are liars we are, the more we hop from relationship to relationship, 
the more we hurt ourselves. That can't be how God intended. We're living in a culture where we're stirring up love multiple times with multiple people outside of marriage and we believe this is normal. Pin drop silence. This can't be how God intended. You live in a culture that hates marriage. You live in a culture that hates men. A culture that hates women, that hates family. Matter of fact, you live in a culture that hates everything God loves. You cannot tell me that you're not tainted by this culture. So, I felt the burden to press into a topic that I believe is of utmost importance to every single person inside this room. Because there is a way to do romance righteously. And I know you don't think God has an opinion about your love life, but he does. By God's grace, I've had the privilege to marry people. I've had the privilege to counsel people who are preparing for marriage. And I have also had the privilege to hear people's ideas of marriage. And one of the things you'll be shocked to find out is there are many Christians who have not sanctified their ideas of marriage. So we will praise God. We'll sing to God. We'll dance for God. We'll sow to God. But you see this area of romance? That's the one thing we're not willing to give over to God. It's the one area we're not unlearning. So because we haven't been taught how to do romance righteously, we subscribe to the cultural way of doing relationship. Because no one's taught us how to do relationships in Christ, we subscribe to how the world is doing relationships. So to understand how to do romance righteously, it's going to require a massive amount of unlearning on everyone's part here. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you willing to unlearn? Now, you see those kittens in your, in your stomach that you're feeling that's fighting against you. Don't manifest during this sermon. Receive me. <laughs> by resisting this lesson you're going to cause more problems from yourself that, that is a prophetic word by resisting this you're going to cause yourself more problems in the long run I'm telling you right now I'm going to present you with something that I believe is going to be a game changer in your life should you receive it my sermon title is counterfeit marriage can I get water please I'm going to explain two concepts to you that are going to make sense later on in this sermon. The first one is dating. The second one is courting. First definition. Dating is being involved with someone for exploration purposes. Dating is being involved with someone for exploration purposes. Courting is being involved with someone with the intention of marriage. Dating is being involved for exploration. Courting is being involved for marriage. Why is this sermon called counterfeit marriage then? I would suggest that dating gives you all the benefits of marriage. Therefore, dating is a counterfeit marriage. Dating gives you all the benefits of marriage without commitment. Therefore, because you are practicing marriage outside of covenant, it is, a co it is a counterfeit marriage. Am I making sense? In fact, dating is not something that's found in the Bible. Marriage is in the Bible. You'll never find in the Bible, take her out on a date. You will never find in the Bible, pick her up. You will never find in the Bible, open the door for her. You will never find in the Bible, this is how you drop game. You will never find in the Bible, this is what to look for in a woman. Dating is not in the Bible. Now, because it's in the Bible, it doesn't mean that dating's bad. But because of the cultural practice that has embedded our Christianity, we have to apply wisdom to tackle this topic in a godly manner. How do you date in Christ? Now, in order for all of this to make sense, I have to do some history work. We have to get to the root of where dating started so we can understand why we're affected the way we are. Let me take you back 80 years. Matter of fact, a generation ago, 75% of people were married. Today, it's down to 50%. Not to mention that 50% of marriages end in divorce. So, if you do the maths on that, 50% of marriages right now happen, and people stay married, but 50% divorce. Do the maths, really and truly, it's like... 25% of successful marriages today. Something's gone wrong. Let me paint a picture for you. 80 years ago, you would find people marrying in their teens. Someone say teens. 
80 years ago, you would find people marrying as teenagers. It was normal to marry at a young age. Now, from a biological and physiological perspective, that makes sense. Marriage would happen at the point of puberty, and most people were parents in their early teens. That's how the world populated so quickly. So people were dying earlier, and people were having marriage and children earlier. But over the years, marriage got delayed more and more. Marriage got set back. The primary reason for this was the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, when trains, cars, machines were invented. So before the Industrial Revolution, it was agricultural. That's the way people did life. You would grow crops, you were farmers, you'd raise sheep, you'd ride horses to get to places, right? So to marry back then, all you needed was land and animals. It was easy. But now comes the Industrial Revolution in the 1760s. The steam engine, the telegraph, all these things are being invented. So now people are transporting their goods on a train, not on horseback or a carriage. The point I'm making with that is the economy started to change. The economy started to rapidly grow. So what this new revolution did was it created a new workforce. Men started to enter industry. They weren't farmers no more. Yeah. So this required more time, more skill and more education on the man's part. So now a man who was once looking after animals, that man now needs to go and get an education and learn a trade or a job. So what started to happen was because men needed an education, we saw people getting married later. Then, we progressed from the Industrial Revolution to the Technological Revolution, where the internet came, where smartphones came, where TV came, where electricity came. And because of that, things got pushed back even further to where now people aren't marrying in their teens. People are marrying in their late 20s, early 30s, where your body clock is now screaming. Okay. So there used to be a short window between when a person developed biologically, hit puberty, and when they got married. So the moment a girl got her period, she was ready for marriage. The moment a boy was 12 years old, he was ready for marriage and for children. All right, think about it. For my Game of Thrones fans, you think of Sansa Stark, you think, if, if you know it. Young people, as soon as they got their blood, they were ready to have children. So this concept of having your house before you get married is new. This concept of needing money before you get married is new. This concept of, of having as, as much experience with the opposite sex is new. Or being in your late 20s is new. All of this is new. Now, am I saying you should marry as a teenager? No. We have to, we have to adapt with the times. So it's my belief right now that if your age still has teen in it, you should not be thinking about a relationship. I believe that for now. You should be thinking about building yourself, your friendships, your degree. You, sh you shouldn't be thinking about relationships yet. But the reason I'm sharing this history is to show you that there is a bigger age gap now between when you reached puberty and when you enter marriage. This is how society set things up. Society set things up in such a way that now men and women are both working, right? So it was just men working until the, the Second World War. The time the Second World War came, men went off to war and women now needed to work in industry. So now women started to pick up the slack of men. What happened in the economy? The economy now burst. What happened? The economy needed to balance. So now you can't rely on just a man's factory wages to survive. You need two incomes to survive in this society. What is that done? Because now a man can't survive off of one salary to look after him and his wife. Men are now struggling to financially provide, so they're proposing later. Has the penny dropped? Okay, so before you could survive off of one salary, now you have to survive off two salaries. So now men are striving to get two salaries so their wife doesn't need to work. So why are men struggling to propose? Because they don't have the financial means to do so. Society has pushed us back further and further. Am I making sense in here? So society and its workforce pushes marriage back to the point where couples who would be ready aren't ready anymore. So what happened then? Because society was pushing it back economically, what happened? A new concept found its way into society where young men and young women would enter into an exclusive relationship apart from covenant. We created a relationship that has many of the benefits of a marital relationship, but is counterfeit. We decided to start dating. And this idea that you would be a couple and not be married is new. 
that people would enter a relationship that mirrors the marriage relationship is new, that people would play marriage and when it ends, experience micro divorces is new. Dating is practicing divorce. Now, let's put that in the context of Christianity because we're committed to Jesus, right? Ah. Huh? We're committed to sexual purity, right? We're committed to this, but we're also committed to a cultural practice of counterfeit marriage. This presents us with a lot of problems. Because because we've adopted how culture does relationship. Hear this now, Christians. We commit ourselves exclusively to a person and say we're dating. Yeah? We're not one yet. We haven't made vows. But we commit, each to, we commit ourselves to each other exclusively, say we're dating, and, and, and so there's this phantom marriage going on in Christianity right now. So we say, actually, you know what, let me tell you about the term dating. This term dating doesn't mean what you think it means, you know. The term dating back in the days, in its original context, meant to make an arrangement to meet somewhere, so you would set a date. So there's a dance going on, we're going to meet, it's a date. Today, dating means a relationship, not meet up somewhere. Dating back then meant... It's a date. We'll meet there. Today, we've changed the definition to mean relationship. So anyway, I'm Christian now. So what we're going to do is we're going to infuse this worldly way of relationship with our faith. So I am loyal to you and only you. You haven't put a ring on it, but I am yours and you are mine. So emotionally, I belong to you. So because we're Christians, let's build this spiritual relationship as well. Because we're Christians, let's bring spirituality into it. So it's, it's both emotional and it's, and, it, and it's spiritual. And, and check this, because we're Christians, we're not going to have a physical relationship though. So we're going to have an emotional relationship and a spiritual relationship, but we're going to fight to not be physical. Here's the problem. The physical always follows the emotional and the spiritual. Do you think you're going to do Bible study? Do you think you're going to deepen in your spiritual commitment? Do you think you're going to be emotionally, emotionally available for one another, but avoid physical commitment altogether? You're setting this place on fire. The spiritual and the emotional commitment was designed by God to manifest itself physically. God didn't design you to commit halfway. Where you're one foot in with each other, but you're always fighting to not be physical. God designed it that you'll be emotional and spiritual and it comes out physically where you grab each other and love each other. So there's something wrong about this. So here's how it starts. I'm satisfied with looking in your eyes at first. And then I go home, yo, how was your day? Yeah, we just looked in each other's eyes, you know. And then it graduates to just a little touch of the hand. Then touching the hand doesn't cut it no more, so it goes to holding hands. Then holding hands doesn't cut it on anymore, so it goes to holding each other. Then holding each other doesn't cut it, so it goes to kissing each other. And then, can, tell me if you know where I'm going. You think kissing was designed to satisfy. Kissing is what prepares you for the third heavens. So you think that you can, you, you can kiss, you can smooch, you can peck. You think you can do that. And, and you could just cut it. And, and not cause frustration and adrenaline and testosterone building inside the person's body. So you're just going to keep tempting each other and pushing the boundary further and further. So there's something wrong with this. It's a pathway to sin. It's a bad foundation. Touching each other is a bad foundation. Stroking each other's hair is a bad foundation. Oh, so what do we do then? How do we do romance righteously? I'm glad you asked. You're Christian now. You're an adult. You're capable of getting married and having babies. But because of cultural changes, you don't get married. So what you do is enter into a counterfeit marriage. And then you expose yourself exclusively, emotionally, and spiritually to a person and fight to not follow through physically. There's nothing healthy about that. There is nothing healthy about that. You're not safe in that. 
These types of relationships were unheard of until the 1940s. And we have accepted these relationships as normal in church. And we're blind to their potential to dishonor God and damage us. And I'm building this so you can actually start to rebuke a faulty mindset and walk into a new mindset. Judges 21, 25. In those days, in those days there, were no king, there was no king in Israel. Because there was no authority, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone right now is doing what they think is right. If I was to ask you, how many choices have you made because you thought it was right in your own eyes? How many times have you actually challenged your mindset with godly wisdom and godly counsel? There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. I am warning you again. This culture is, you're pulling wisdom from this godless culture and you're pulling wisdom from fallen people and you're pull, pulling wisdom from people who are out here telling you to move like... You're pulling wisdom from fallen people. From a culture that hates marriage. From a culture that hates family. That's where you're pulling wisdom from. So I had to build it that way. So you can see how serious I'm being here. Because I really believe this word will be a word that changes relationships here. There may be some breakups in this room today. And I, I, I welcome it. That will be a testimony. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Don't be shy. Raise your hands if you're in a relationship and you're not married. Come on, there's more of you. Come on. Not in this room. Not in this room. That's not it. Come on. I see you. All right. I see you. I see you. Here's, here's your first lesson. You can drop your hands now, guys. Here's your first lesson. You ready? Here's your first lesson. Now it has to be practical now, yeah? Now I'm going to give you some practical tips. Here's your first lesson. Every single one of you that raised your hands and those of you who will enter into a relationship, here is your first lesson. In the Bible, there is no category of a romantic relationship outside of engagement and marriage. I'll say it again. In the Bible, there is no category of a relationship outside of engagement or marriage. In the eyes of the Bible, if you're not married, you're single. 1 Corinthians 7, 8. To the, someone say it. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain what? To the unmarried. To the unmarried. So, the person who's engaged is unmarried. The person who's in a relationship, boyfriend and girlfriend right now, is unmarried. To the unmarried, stay single. Meaning, if you're engaged and if you're doing boyfriend and girlfriend, in the eyes of God, you're still single. That's a revelation. Check this out. Femi and Tayo, you're single. Wait, 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 wait. Because now it, it, it's like I'm going to be out in relationships. Toby and Daniela, you're getting married in two weeks. As of right now, you're still single. Nizar and Rihanna, you're still single. Michael, Emiola, you're still single in the eyes of God. You guys have not made vows to God yet. I'm not single. I am Rona, Rona's mine. Michelle's not single, you're Alan's. Alan's is yours. Melanie, Daniel, you're not single. Daniel's yours, you're his. But if you're in a relationship doing boyfriend and girlfriend, you're single in the eyes of God. You're not one, you don't belong to each other. So you see how you exclusively commit yourself in a relationship where no one's put a ring on it. You're not boyfriend and girlfriend. In fact, I've said this before, you're not called to be someone's boyfriend or girlfriend. Wait, because right now, what we're seeing in society is people doing that professional boyfriend, professional girlfriend. You're not boyfriend or girlfriend, you're single. 
You were called to be a friend, a sister, or a wife. You were called to be a friend, a brother, or a husband. There's no in-between. I'm going to try and get maggot out of our brain here, yeah? You're no one's boo. You're no one's babe, yeah? You're not. You're single. You're single. Even if you think you're in a relationship, you're single. You're still single at the proposal until a ring comes on it. You're single. And you only step out of being single once you step into marriage. Because even in the engagement, things can lock off. You are not in a relationship. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. And I know you're sat down right next to him, so it might be a bit... <laughs> but you're not together. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. All right. If you're in a relationship and they're sat right next to you, that's your brother in Christ. I know, we don't like that, innit? Don't call me brother in Christ. Yeah, you've been trying to do flirting with your brother or sister. And I know, you're like, so how do we do romance righteously? We're getting there. But that's your brother and that's your sister. You should be in the friend zone. Let me say it again. You see, this is why we get hung up and church feels like the gulag. Because we get emotional too quickly when we're supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ. So now church is a team death match. And you didn't even get committed. You weren't even in a relationship. You weren't even married. But now, you know, we stepped in too quickly. So now I need to leave church because my ex, that's not your ex. And you see how you're trying to fight what I'm saying? You see how you're trying to fight what I'm saying? You're trying to justify the way that you're doing relationship. It's fine. They, they have ears, but they won't hear. It's okay. It's on you. There's a way to do romance righteously. So, so what's the way to do romance righteously? It's a hard way. Someone say it's a hard way. You know what the Bible says? Wide is the road that leads to destruction and many go through it. There's a way that leads to destruction and everyone's taking that road. But you see, the way that is Christ is narrow. And few find it. When it says it's narrow, we're talking about a narrow path. It's not narrow like you're walking on. No, it's narrow as in there's two walls and you're going through it like this. That's the way that you're supposed to be doing relationship. Like this. That's the narrow path. You're stuck between two walls and you're doing this. That's a true follower of Jesus Christ. If that's what you're doing... And you're walking that narrow path that really shows that you're actually following Jesus. There's a wide way and a narrow way. Which way are you going to choose? The cultural way, which is wide. Or the Christian way, which is narrow. Are you a real follower of Jesus to choose the narrow path and do romance righteously? Or are you going to continue following the culture? And doing boyfriend and girlfriend until Jesus comes back. And then passing this anniversary and that second anniversary and the third anniversary and the fourth anniversary and the fifth anniversary. Now you're asking, where am I in this relationship? Which one do you want to choose? What's the second option? And the better option. And the best option for everyone inside this room to do romance correctly. This might just save your life. And if you're not taking notes, this is really bad. <laughs> the second option is something called courtship. Someone say courtship. courtship. Courtship is preparation for marriage. Dating does not have marriage in mind. In dating, I reluctantly discuss marriage. Yeah? Am I, am I here? Yeah. So someone being your boyfriend or your girlfriend is not a proposal. 
It's just fun. We're just test driving each other. That's what dating is. I just want someone to call, someone to text because I don't want to be lonely. Right? Marriage is not the goal of dating. In fact, in dating, you give me all the privileges of marriage, so I'm definitely not proposing now. Do you know what? Ladies, I want to give you so much wisdom, you know, because you guys are so incredible, but I need you to understand your power. The difference between the needs of a man and the needs of a woman, men are different, yeah? Women are different. Hear this. Men want sex. Women want security. Turn to your neighbor and say that. Men want sex. Women want security. This is why women get excited when the ring comes. Women get excited when the ring comes. Let a man go when the ring's on him. It's, it's mad. This ring signifies security to a woman. Women want security. Men want sex. Women, you are giving men sex, but you're not getting security. Who has the power of sex? Women, right? So if all women choose to close their legs, men will start marrying. No, no. Stop giving him sex. Do you know what it's like? Do you know what it's like? It's like you've given me my, my certificate before I even started school. It's like you gave me my certificate before I even started school. What's the point of me showing up for class then? I don't have to be committed. You gave me my certificate already. So why? I don't have to show commitment. Dating. Oh, Jesus Christ. Dating doesn't have marriage in mind. Courtship has a different goal. Courtship is advanced dating. It's doing dating with marriage in mind. It has a time frame. The most that you're going to get out of an anniversary with courting is one anniversary. You won't have more than one anniversary with courtship. Dating has no time frame. Courting has a time frame because it's intentional. Are you guys ready to find out about courting? Okay. This is the way it was done back in the days. But I don't think this is how it, how it should be done now. But back then, if you were going out on a date, you'd have a chaperone. You'd have someone who would watch you at all times following you. You wouldn't just go anywhere. Yeah? So that's how courting did it back then. Now, I don't think courting is making a comeback. But courting has some advantages, and you need to hear these advantages. The first advantage is this. Are you ready in this Catholic church today? Yes. Your first one is this. Courting involves family and authority figures. Let me show you why this is so healthy. Let me show you why this is so healthy. Courting involves authority figures in the relationship from the beginning. Let me show you why this is healthy. In dating, it's exclusive one-to-one. -one. You don't involve your father figures. You don't involve authority figures. You just do things in secret. So I'll show up with the person I've been with three years and be like, oh yeah, here he is. Here she is. After the fact, I already look at that as dishonor. As the parent, I already look at that as dishonor. Because there's been some emotional stuff going on in there, some arguments going on that I don't know anything about. Now I need to catch up with someone that your heart is already braided to and I had no involvement. As the parent who brought you into this earth, I'm the one who's going to walk you down that aisle and hand you over to the man. But dating does everything in secret. Courtship does everything public and it's inclusive. You give your family room to speak into the relationship. Ha! The couple are expected to spend time with the other families so that they can get to know each other. Why is that important? First of all, when you're in love, you can't see the relationship like other people see it. Am I lying? 
Am I lying? So, it's courteous. Think about that word, courteous, courtship. Courteous. It is courteous for you to involve that person with your family before anything goes forward. Right? I don't want to know. I'm me, Because I'm, you know why I'm saying it like this now? I'm a dad. Yeah? I don't want no donut manipulating Nyla. Oh, you see when you guys are fathers, you'll understand where I'm coming from. Hear me and hear me well. Yeah? There is a way to do romance righteously and the first way is to involve parental figures. And you don't approach parental figures and say, God said this is my husband. Excuse me? So you think Nyla is going to come to me and say, Dad, God said this is my husband. And I'm going to look at her and go, oh, yeah. <laughs> you approach this open for wise counsel so they can scrutinize this person. You know one of the reasons why, because there's traditional relationships, traditional, yeah? So you have the traditional wedding and you have the white wedding. That's how societies mess things up as well. Because the way it was going back in the days was it was just a traditional wedding. So the parents see the traditional as the real wedding. So until the traditional happens, it's not a real marriage in their eyes. Yeah? So, so I'm saying your parents need to be involved in the whole makeup of this situation. It's important to involve them. Am I speaking in there? Okay. So what the man would do in a courtship relationship is he would approach a father and he'd get down on his knee and he'd ask the father for a blessing. Can I pursue your daughter with the intention of marriage? First step. How would you feel, women? If you knew that the man that was pursuing you went to your father or went to an authority figure and asked their permission first, would that not communicate some level of integrity, some level of honor, some level of security, rather than doing the round the back way? Oh yeah, I just like you, I just moved to you, I just got your number. The relationship in courtship doesn't start at boyfriend and girlfriend. Do you know where it starts? Fiance. The moment that a man comes to approach a father and says, I am, I, I am interested in pursuing your daughter with the intention of marriage, that is a semi-proposal already. It started, and, and you, start, you go into the relationship as a semi-fiancé. That's an incredible start to a relationship. It has intention. It has intention. The second thing that courtship does is it brings formality into the relationship. Formality. So... <laughs> All right, let me, do it, let me do it this way. Courtship is almost a mini arranged marriage. No, I know. I know. But let me give you some, stat some statistics. 4% of arranged marriages fail. I'm going to say it again just so you hear it. 4% of arranged marriages fail, which means 90%, 96% of, ar of arranged marriages succeed. 4% of arranged marriages fail. Guess how many... Autonomous marriages fail. 50%. Take that statistic in. 4% of arranged marriages where parents are involved fail. 50% of autonomous marriages where people just do it because of love fail. What's the problem? Where's the difference? Where's the difference? In arranged marriages, and I'm not, I'm not advocating for it, by the way, but hear me. In arranged marriages, because you didn't enter the relationship in love and with feelings, you go into the relationship having to figure each other out. So you end up fighting for love. Whereas in an autonomous relationship, you entered with love already. So when you get married and you see another side of her, it's scary. Am I making sense here? Am I making sense? Am I making sense? Let me just say right now, my dad could never pick my wife for me. Let me just say it now. What I'm talking about here is the principle. The principle is once you believe you can be with them for the rest of your life, bring them home. Don't bring them when you're pregnant.
Okay. Bring them home. Now, don't get it twisted. There are some families that are dysfunctional. That's why the church is important. Because if it's not your, 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 your parental figures, the church. But some authority figure has to be involved in that relationship from the beginning. Third thing, courtship, courtship sets planning in motion. What it does is because you've now approached the father and said, I am pursuing your daughter with the intention of marriage, it allows the family to then start preparing for the marriage financially. So now the family are not caught off guard by a proposal. Am I making sense here? It started with a vision. The relationship started with a vision. And women, you should settle for nothing less than a man who approaches you with some vision. I'm not here to date you just so that we can flex on each other and then lock each other off. And I now have a black bag of, of baggage taking it into my next one. Come on. That can't be how God intended relationships to be. The fourth one is courtship follows a relational ladder. Here's the relational ladder. Courtship is spiritual first, then it's social, then it's emotional, then it's physical. Courtship starts spiritually, then it goes to socially, then it goes to emotionally, then it goes physically. Let's start with the first one. Spiritual. Here's how you start a courtship relationship. First, you build a relationship with your brother or sister in Christ. Say brother and sister. Because they're your friend first, yeah? You start building a relationship with your brother or sister in Christ on spiritual values. So the conversation starts with you talking about God and you connect on that level. So you talk about vision, you talk about values, you talk about faith. So how did you become a Christian? What are your priorities? What are your beliefs about educating children? What do you think about a woman's role in marriage? What do you think about a man's role in marriage? You start with those godly basics first. The courtship does not start with love. You get to know the person first and you do a background check on the person. You guard your heart. So I would suggest in a courtship relationship, you allow your heart to go from 0% to 25%. In a courtship relationship, you... Women, especially, I'm speaking to you first, yeah? Because the men are the ones pursuing. And men, I'm going to hit you in a second. Women, you allow your heart to get from 0% to 25% when a man starts in putting his interest in. Don't get too invested. Some people literally go from 0 to 100 when, when a man says hello. All he said was hello. I'm talking about God in your heart. And when I say guard your heart, 0% to 25%, don't fall in love with a guy who has not asked you on a date. You should not be crying your eyes out about a guy who has not taken you to dinner. I don't want you to get heartbroken because a guy never shared his expectations with you. You need to learn how to guard your heart. I want, you, I want you to be real about your emotions, but I want to caution you, guard your heart. So you allow your heart to go from 0% zero to 25% zero to at this stage. Then, after that, when it gets to the engagement stage and he, he actually proposes to you, you allow your heart to go from 25% to 50, not to 100. When we're speaking in the beginning, 0% to 25%, when he proposes and gets down on one knee, 25% to 50. Because in the engagement, you can still lock it off. Am I here? <laughs> then at marriage, you go 100%. Off your pant. At marriage. I said, I said that. Sizzling. Off it. 100% at marriage. 0% to 25% in the talking stage. Am I moving mad? <laughs> but this is why God said, you're, you're my, God said you're my wife is mad because you're already at 100%. Are you guys receiving me? 
Okay. So the first one's spiritual. You talk about God. The second one's social. Social. At this point, you still don't belong to each other. If he asks you out, you can say yes. If he says he likes you romantically and wants to get to know you, that's okay. But let him be aware that we're not going to act as if we're a couple. We're not going to act as if we're together. Yeah? So I'm okay discovering you and getting to know you, but I'm still at 25% here, if that. Yeah? So I don't date you to check you out. It's a friendship where you check people out. I check you out in friendship. I can't get rejected here. Am I, am I making sense here, guys? I can't get rejected here. So every discussion right now is me testing your character. And it's during this time that you determine whether it's wise to take the next step or not. There's no pressure at this moment. Go out in, gro go out in groups. Hang out with other people. And you share activities with each other. You don't share feelings with each other. Do you, do you want to know how to stir up love too quickly? FaceTime too much. Text each other too much. Speak morning, noon, and night about everything. Do too much too quickly. Share your hurt quickly. Share your pain quickly. Go on holiday with each other. Cohabitate. Live in the same home with each other. That's how you awaken love quickly. Let that sit with you for a second. <laughs> you want to know when it's mad? At this stage when you can't go three days without feeling lovesick, that's when you know you're in too deep. That's when you know you're in too deep because you're not married. At this point, in the social point, and do you know what? Because those of you in relationships, you need a real reality check after this. When I say you need an MOT, you need a health check of your relationship after this. If you leave here and continue the same way and heartbreak comes, don't come running to anybody. I'm giving you principles on how you guard your heart. If that man is not intentional, lock it off. Have a conversation right after this. Where are we going? We need to put boundaries in place. We need to go back to this. I'm messing up your relationship. You see, at this stage, I'm messing you guys up. You see, at this stage, you're checking. I'm speaking to you women. I'm giving you power, you know. Women, you're checking his intentions at this point. You're checking his honesty. Does he keep his word? Or am I too infatuated right now that I can't see beyond it? Check him. Does he keep his word? If you're on the phone too long and the conversation goes dry, don't sleep on the phone listening to each other's heartbeat. Lock off the phone. Let me say it again. No, hear me. Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Because this pillow talk is killing you lot. You're awakening love too quickly. Let me say it again. If you're on the phone and the conversation's going nowhere and both of you are silent, lock off the phone. He'll look at it like, raw, I need to have a better conversation next time. Make him chase you. Do you know what else is important about this? Because you're brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you know what else is important? Man them, hear this. You don't have to buy her gifts. see the brothers jumping right now your brothers and sisters in Christ I'm not one with you so hear this I don't need to take you Hakkasan I don't need to run up my, my bank I don't need to pay anything for you You're... I need you to hear me <laughs> I 
No, 100. We're going to do relationships righteously. So check this out. Back in the days, the first time a man would spend money on his woman was the bride price. Right now, you've spent the bride price on all your dates. Let me come back, because you know what? If I touch this button, if I touch this button about wedding costs today, I'll get flogged by all the sisters in it. Let me tell you, the right way to do relationship is I don't start sending you Valentine's Day stuff. I don't start sending you birthday presents. I can, but it's courtesy. I don't owe you anything. Me and you are not one. And if I do it, it's me showing you my intention after I've spoken with your father. <laughs> the mandem are getting revelation, you know. I'm trying to help you because you're emptying your pocket for someone and you may not be with them in the future. So you've probably spent bags on someone that you didn't even get with in the future. It was a bad investment. Listen, you can throw away wisdom or you can listen. I don't mind. Me, I'm married. I'm trying to help you. Okay, anyway. You see at this stage, because it, because it starts spiritually, then it goes to socially. You guys shouldn't even be arguing. Because you're not committed yet, every single time there's an argument, I this is long, you know. I this is long. Of course it's long. You haven't made a commitment. You guys should not be arguing at this point. Until the proposal, there's no guarantee of marriage. Why are you wasting your energy? Don't fall head over heels in love with a man who may not be sure about you. Courtship, is, it should be the best time for a couple. Marriage is where things heat up. Marriage is where you guys really need to figure this thing out, right? But this cohabitating, dating way of doing life gets us in emotionally invested too quickly. And then we end up beefing each other before the marriage has even come. So now you guys are resentful at the, at the altar. Rather than exploring the rest of life with each other to conform and become one. You have basically become one before the relationship. So marriage isn't fun. Can I see myself doing the rest of my life with this person? They're nagging me already. So it's spiritual. Then it's social. Then it goes to emotional. When does emotional happen? So you've gone 0% to 25%. At the proposal, that's when you go 25% to 50%. The proposal, this is the emotional part, at the proposal. I'm, I'm not saying that you can't have emotions. I, but what, what I want you to understand is at the engagement, it can still be cooled off. So you cannot have your heart in 100% at this point. 25% to 50%. I want you to be able to survive knowing you didn't give your whole heart away in this relationship. There's a time frame for it. It's one year of your life. It's not long. So you will survive if it doesn't, if it doesn't work out. 0%, 25% to 50% here. The problem here, do I even say this? I'll say it again. Because there has to be, the Bible says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Do not bend to the culture. Do not bend to the way they're doing it, but, but be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is a mind renewal. The problem here is we're not looking at it in this process. So we go from 0% to 100% already. We misinterpret actions. We misinterpret things. Then we get off FaceTime. We talk too much. We don't put boundaries in place. We awaken love before it's time. We don't guard our heart. And that's why there's so many damaged people around here. And I'm trying to prevent you from feeling the damage that dating has brought into Christianity. Jesus. Spiritual. Involve your family. Involve your mentors. Talk about God. Social. Slow yourselves down. 
I'll even say some of you smile at each other too much in this church. Don't share your feelings too quickly. Don't share your feelings too quickly. You don't even know what they like. You don't even know their hobbies. You don't even know their beliefs. You don't even know their value system. You don't know anything about them. The only thing I know is you're beautiful. Proverbs 31, 30 says, charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Charm is not enough. I'm sorry. Beauty fades, right? All of this fades. So you don't want to skip talking about God and you don't want to skip getting to know each other as friends. Do not rush this. When I give you this, 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 this basically order of doing relationship, it's not the first day we talk about God. Then the second day we talk about socializing. Then the third day we say we love each other. Take your time. Am I, am I here? I'm here, yeah? All right. So, again, let me just tell you, make him chase you. Make him desperate. Starve him of attention. If he's not chasing you, he's not serious. And for you guys inside this church who are hearing, hearing all of this and saying, you know what, this sounds like too much, too much pressure for a relationship. Do you know what the Bible says about you? Do not be a waste man. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> watch this. The Bible says in Proverbs 7, don't be a waste man, you know. Let me get it. Proverbs 7, watch this. Watch, 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 watch. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend. Call this teaching your intimate friend. All right? To keep you from the forbidden woman. From the adulteress with her smooth words. Because, guys, there's women inside you who are going to put up boundaries. You may not feel like chasing them, but you know that you can chase one quickly and get it quick, right? Keep you from the forbidden woman. From the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house... I have looked out through my lattice and I have seen among the simple, simple men, I have perceived amongst the youths, the youth, a young man lacking sense. The Bible says, don't be a waste man. Don't lack sense. This is sense now. Next one, Proverbs 7.10. This talks about the type of women that the mandem would go for because the women in this church will set up boundaries. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, willy of heart, she is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. This is the woman you like, Abby. It's this one. It's this one. Because it's easy and you can get what you want, right? Let's go to the next one. Proverbs seven twenty one. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter... Or as a stag is caught fast to an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, a trap, he does not know it will cost him his life. You think you're doing gang, 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 gang by chasing this woman, not knowing the devil is doing gang on you. You think you're bad. The man that are going to rate you, right? It, women have standards. The men here have to step up to standards. Say no. Women, I'm going to say it again have standards. Men here step up to standards. Spiritual, social, emotional. Emotional comes after the proposal, then it's physical. Physical happens in marriage. Now you can go from 50% to 100%. You can awaken love. You can open the floodgates of heaven. You can go crazy. You can do the mad thing. It's mad. Marriage happened. It's okay. The marriage bed is undefiled. Rona, Rona, the marriage bed is undefiled. It's okay. I'm married. I can talk about it. 100%. We're in it. So the pro progression of courtship is this. Spiritual, social, emotional, physical. Right? In dating, it's the opposite. In dating, you start with the physical. Then you start to socialize and try and figure each other out. Then it's emotional. Then it's, oh, we need to run to God. 
and involve God in our situation. In dating, you start the reverse. You start physically with each other. Then you get emotional with each other because you've actually opened each other up. I can't believe you used me and I'm so sorry that that happened. And then it goes to social. Let's try and figure each other out because we've actually made a mess of this situation. Now let's bring God into the situation. Parents weren't involved. Family weren't involved. Marriage wasn't the end goal. We were just out here having fun with each other. Now you might say, I like that better. But look at the result. Look at the results. Could that be God's will? So, here's how I'm landing this. I'm going to give you two ways of viewing it. When a girl's being courted, she doesn't look at herself as I'm now off the market. She's single, but with the possibility of marriage. She hasn't gone crazy yet. So she doesn't belong to the man that she's getting to know, and he doesn't belong to her. She's just exploring the possibility of marriage with a brother in Christ and vice versa. So here's a helpful way to make you understand language used by a person in dating and language used by a person in courting. Here's the differences. In dating, are you single? No, I'm taken. In courting, are you single? Yes, but I'm getting to know someone with marriage in mind. A bit more healthy, right? Dating. You see that guy over there? We used to be with each other, but we broke up. Courting. I was being pursued by a guy, but it didn't end in marriage. Right? Okay. Check this. Dating. He's my boyfriend. Courting. He's the guy who's interested in me at the moment. Dating. We post each other online. Change our Facebook status. Now everyone congratulates us. Courting, the necessary people know. We're only considering marriage. Until we decide to get engaged, there's no celebration. The benefits of pursuing courtship without dating. You avoid being the cause of someone experiencing rejection, heartbreak, and the harm of being dumped. Thank you. The benefits. One, two. The benefits of pursuing courtship without dating. You avoid being the cause of someone experiencing heartbreak, rejection, and dumping. You also avoid the public experience of shame associated when a relationship ends. You also avoid wasting precious years being off the market with someone who may not end up marrying you. So, do I see courtship being restored back to its rightful place in this generation? No. But do I think each one of your relationships should really think about how you're doing with it currently and is it honoring God yes are you dating with intentionality to figure things out are you sure about the person you're dating if not you are walking towards a heartbreak and you were not created for that we're brothers and sisters in Christ treat each other as such until a ring is on that finger amen